We'll finish up by talking a bit about globalization and protectionism that helps fight against globalization. If you recall, we began class all those weeks ago with a really big question. What enables some people in the world to be so much richer? We see different levels of human flourishing around the globe. And we've identified quite a number of different aspects to that. It's not a simple question. It's not something with an easy answer. Throughout the class, we've talked about rates of growth and how even small differences compounded over time can be really magnified. Whether an economy grows by 1.3% or 1.8% sounds like a small thing, but it makes a big difference over generations. The grandchildren will see really big differences. Recall the solo growth decomposition says that per capita GDP growth comes from three sources. Growth in skills, human capital, growth in machines and physical capital, more factories, and growth in technology and organizational effectiveness. We want to learn about policies that can increase those factors and help countries to grow faster. Of course, GDP isn't everything, but we've seen so many measures of human development correlate with GDP. Globalization also correlates with GDP growth. As the world has gotten wealthier, trade volumes have increased even more. You hear a lot of people who don't like globalization for various reasons and want to restrict it. But while globalization has costs and benefits, it's tough to restrict the cost without also restricting the benefits. Some of the most common forms of protectionism are trying to protect domestic workers or domestic firms from international trade. These could be through tariffs, which are taxes on imported goods, quotas, which are restrictions on how many imports are allowed in, or non-tariff barriers, which are different regulations that make imports more costly. The World Trade Organization, the WTO, has reduced tariffs and quotas, but all those non-tariff barriers are more difficult to address. Protectionism is a way of helping suppliers and hurting consumers. We go back to our basic supply and demand graphs. A tariff is going to shift the supply curve inward. That's the lighter line there. The total supply curve is domestic supply plus imports. As imports are reduced, whether by tariff or quota or some other policy, that shifts the supply curve inward. So consumers pay a higher price and producers get to sell their goods for more. Obviously producers like that. And often there are fewer of them and they're better organized so they can lobby the government for those policies. Does protectionism save jobs? The evidence here is actually, nah. There's some evidence that it helps workers in the protected industry in the short run, but not more. As domestic firms lose the ability to compete in the global market, that causes more problems. By raising prices for some goods, consumers have less money to spend on other industries. And if these are inputs, then that can raise the cost for other firms. If we look at the costs per job, it's often extremely high. It's common to see estimates the total cost might be several hundred thousand dollars per job. And of course, the employees are not getting all that money. The companies get a lot of it. The fundamental politics are that politicians take a little money from each of a huge number of people and then give a lot of money to a very few people. If policy takes a dollar from every person in the U.S., that's over $300 million. Politicians give that to a very few companies and they've made some people really happy. A lot of politics works that way. Politicians impose very small harm to a very diffuse group of people in order to make a few people very happy with them. It's good for a career. Does protectionism help wages, even if it's not necessarily saving jobs? There's certainly some increase in the protected industry, but there's limited evidence that globalization helps high-skill workers more than low-skill workers, so perhaps contributing to global inequality. A person without a high school degree is competing against billions of people in the world with similar educational qualifications. As you know for yourselves and perhaps your family, that's tough. A college degree or an advanced degree means competing against a much smaller group of people. 
immigration might have a similar impact. With all these policies, there's a trade-off. There's a one-time benefit to protectionism, but then it lowers the rate of growth. We have to ask, what are the acceptable trade-offs? How much are we willing to lose 10, 20, 30 years from now in order to get a certain amount of money right now? It's a tough thing to balance, especially because the people who are going to be around in future decades are not doing much voting now. What are some of the classic arguments in favor of protectionism? Sometimes they're to help what are called infant industries, get them off the ground. Another one is anti-dumping. Perhaps other countries might sell products really cheap in order to drive my country's firms out of business. Maybe some tariffs will keep my country's firms in business. It's unclear how much weight that has in the real world. Sometimes protectionism is justified for reasons of the environment. If you think firms that are making a product in another country are doing so in a much more environmentally harmful way, perhaps they should pay more of a tariff to make up for the pollution they're creating. Finally, there's national defense. Country must keep some industries within their own borders because they need to make ammunition. All these get stretched out. For the longest time, U.S. producers of mohair, a type of wool, were given protection because they were thought to be important to the national defense because that sort of wool went into a certain sort of uniforms. It doesn't sound like a good argument to me either, but that's what people did. There are organizations that push against protectionism. Beyond WTO that we talked about, there are a lot of other collections of countries. The United States is itself a giant free trade zone, dating back centuries now. It's relatively unusual that people in Maine can trade freely with people in California or even Hawaii. Perhaps it's related that the same area has been one of the fastest growing throughout those centuries. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, is the combination of the USA plus Canada plus Mexico. The European Union also collects countries with zero tariffs, but also are systematically dismantling non-tariff barriers to make it easier for firms in Spain to sell products in Poland. But there's still barriers. Even in the US, things like licensing. To do certain jobs in certain states, you need to have a license. If you move from New York to New Jersey, it may not be easy to transfer that license. Again, that's kind of protectionism and to slow down economic growth.